Look, we've heard it for years. Koreans are pretty good at League of Legends. <laughs> oh, the board for Korean high train. Yeah, trench line coming through. Big, big equalizer. Big shockwave comes through. Franker oh, just absolutely devastates the ranks of KT Roaster. The ultimate coming out, out to score. Dev gave it a pick up. Graves in the bag. And it's still a very close fight. And the score gets even lower. He's just barely going to go down. Dev is really the MVP of this fight, though, as he takes out another. Still trying to go up to key now. Picks up a triple kill. After getting a server at the end of 2011, the region won nearly every International League of Legends competition. They showed us what true dominance looks like. And then, they scattered. Welcome to Korean Talk, where all we talk about are the Korean players and China. Yep. Yep, this is pretty much our life, and so today we're going to be talking about more Korean players, as we will probably next week. After Samsung White's world victory in 2014, organizations all over the world made bids to attract top Korean talent. NA and EU teams made bids, to be sure, but more than anyone else, Chinese organizations made huge offers to Korean stars to get them to play in the LPL. During that offseason, both of Samsung's starting rosters left the region, and they took some of Korea's top talents with them, like Piglet and Impact. It was absolutely monumental. Everything changed. If the rest of the world couldn't keep up, then it was time to buy some Korean talent. So when you think about China coming onto the scene, a big piece of it is how are they going to get players? The Chinese players were all right at the time, but everybody knew that Korea had the best players. And so what was going to send them over, it definitely was a lot of money. At the time in Korea, esports teams mostly acted as marketing arms for huge corporations like SK Telecom and Samsung. Their players wore their logos, and since esports were already popular in Korea, it was a good way for these companies to build their brands. But those players weren't the ones signing massive blockbuster contracts. And that was how China and the rest of the world drew those top players into places where esports wasn't as well built out. They started getting offers that you couldn't imagine you would ever hear in Korea for a salary, plus sponsorships, plus streaming opportunities. The world champions disbanded for, for money and for different opportunities. Instead of marketing for companies, these players were signing contracts where they were the main attraction. They were going into a market where esports could be built around them. This was a year that set the groundwork for massive outside investment in esports. By the end of the year, we saw teams like Echo Fox and Immortals building League of Legends rosters. And they all looked towards Korea. Fans have the right to be scared, especially since, you know, we look at past examples like in Europe with StarCraft, where Koreans came in and completely took over the European scene. You think about that situation, you say, do I really want my NALCS, like our eSport, to be dominated by Korean players? In North America, we've all come to know that Twitch is the place to go to for streaming. But in China, that's not the case. There are plenty of streaming platforms that are analogous to Twitch, and they're all competing for territory. And to do that, they sponsored League of Legends players. At the time, China was awash in streaming money. So there were a bunch of competing streaming services that were sponsoring teams. They would have all of this money to spend lavishly on some of the best Korean players. Many of the Korean players who made the move to China signed huge contracts, but they included streaming obligations which required them to stream on platforms like Huya and Douyu who subsidized their contracts. Of course, it wasn't just Chinese teams that imported talent. Some Korean players made the jump to the LCS stage as well. Uh, 마이 그러니까 우 다시 말할게요. 음, 해외 경험도 해보고 싶었고 그리고 일단 미국이 그 가, 저, 나라를 좀 돌아다녔었는데 가장 세계 좋았고. The next year, Korean players were just as dominant as they'd ever been, but they were dominant in every region. Both North America and Europe benefited from the imported Korean talent, and of course, China added a ton of Korean talent that they started to work into their now hybrid super teams. I feel like this is definitely the meta, especially for Deft. And so even making that ranking for who's the best bottom lane, I think I would go for Deft because he has that style in which he wants to play for the team. Porn and Deft have looked amazing so far. Almost strict upgrades. Yeah, Porn and Deft, as you say, almost strict upgrades. They've definitely slotted in very well. Having Porn in the mid lane gives them some engage opportunities because, of course, the previous mid laner was more of a wave clear mid more of a safe laner. Pawn loves to pick up that fizz and play aggressively. They're getting picks from that pawn. All the while, there are more eyes on the game as a whole. 
partially because people wanted to see how the whole exodus would work out. That said, there were some hiccups. It took rosters some time to gel as players found out it's pretty hard to communicate on a team where not everyone speaks the same language. It became clear that winning games wasn't as easy as just putting a bunch of superstars on a team. That in mind, there were also victors. Edward Gaming made history with their counterpick strategy that defeated SKT at MSI. Yes! He locks it in for game five. Faker has never lost with LeBlanc on the competitive stage. SK Telecom T1 are wiped. The Nexus turrets are going down. LPL's Edward Gaming are the 2015 Mid-Season Invitational Champions. Or how Fnatic was able to make it to World Semifinals that same year with the addition of both Huni and Rainover. And Fnatic will advance to the semifinals. The only team to do that three times in the World Championships. But despite some flashes of brilliance, by the end of 2015, it seemed like the Exodus wasn't having the kind of long-term impact that most of these organizations were hoping for. We all learned that it wasn't as simple as just adding talent. Players needed to play well together, needed to communicate, needed to play as a team in order to win at the highest level. It did temporarily pay off for the Chinese teams. So in the very short term, yes, none of them really made it work. No player was successful in maintaining a consistent lifestyle where they could focus on the game. The language barrier proved to be a little bit more difficult than they would have liked. The overwhelming prowess of Korean League of Legends was slowly bleeding into other regions. But perhaps more impressive than anything else that happened that year was that Korea didn't miss a beat. Oh, Izium might be in a little bit of trouble now, though. Here comes Kuro the wall. Izium pushes him away with that ultimate. Oh, man, it's a 4v1 flashing. Can he make it out? Death sentence! Oh, but he manages to cleanse it. Doesn't matter. Kuro gets the kill anyway. Okay, whoa, Easy Hood manages to steal the dragon, and now SKT going for the fight over the wall. He comes. A kill for Easy Hood as well. SK Telecom, can they finish this one up? Step going deep, make it a double for Easy Hood. Some of the region's brightest stars left the country, but their shoes were immediately filled by some of the best to ever play the game. That year showed us just how deep the Korean talent pool really is. And of course, 2015 marked the beginning of SKT's devastating two-year run, where they won nearly every tournament they participated in. Two tigers are falling. SKT will be your first ever two-time world champions! They turn their attention to the Nexus and SK Telecom continue to rule the world and they are your mid-season invitational champions. SK Telecom have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. The SKT reign continues. They win their third world championship. But maybe what's also worth remembering is what the year did to the game as a whole. According to Riot Games, World's viewership increased from 288 million in 2014 to 334 million in 2015. And all of a sudden, investors were looking at League of Legends franchises the same way they look at traditional sports. By 2017, many of the Korean players who had left for China returned home. But there were some success stories. In storybook fashion, Rookie hoisted the Summoner's Cup as Invictus Gaming became the first Chinese organization to become world champions. Well, <sighs> 非常感谢以来支持爱着所有的粉丝，支持爱一直支持卢克的粉丝们，我才能做到现在这个位置，才能达到这个位置，我非常感谢粉丝们，谢谢。In some ways, it felt like the perfect ending to the revolving door of Korean exports over the last few years. For the guy who bought in hardest to his new team, learned to speak Mandarin, and built a career with IG, this was proof that Rookie made the right choice. And in the end, he emerged victorious when the dust settled on the great Korean exodus. Thanks for watching. If you want more great content just like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.